Well, I have my uh, summer jacket on and uh, it is that season of uh, June and, and summer is at hand. Well, you know about the uh, things changing to green on the 12th and we are making preparations, careful preparations, so that we might open and have the facilities available for us to worship again in the near future. We're working on that. A task group is, uh, is preparing to that end, and uh, we'll be giving you an update uh, real soon. So uh, pray about that, and uh, thank you for your patience. Now, a uh, prayer for this uh, time uh, that we come before God. O God of life, God of all, God of all creation, this season of summer, late spring, is, is a sign of the manifest spirit of, of your creation before us. All oh, the beauty of this time of year, we, we give you praise for and we thank you. But even more, we thank you for the beauty within us. For you, Lord, have counted us as precious in your sight, and we give you praise for that, and, and we thank you for your abiding spirit and for your transformational love that came to us when we asked you to come into our lives in, in, our, in, in our time and in that moment when we said, Jesus, I need to have you in my life. And we confess that, and we came to new life in you, and we praise you for that. Lord, as we're considering uh, uh, coming back together again to worship, we pray that you might guide that process and you might cause us all to come together again in a spirit of love and truth. Lord, as your people, we desire to be fully in love with you and one another now, Lord, I, I lift up prayers uh, for those, those who are, are hurting because of the issues about the, uh, the racism and, and the, well, Lord, you, you know all of this, and I just ask that you would help us through this, to guide us to be those who are compassionate and caring to all persons. And Lord, and Lord, Help us to be all the more your people. Thank you for your love and your guiding presence. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have uh, some scriptures uh, to offer before you, too, this uh, time around. The first is uh, from Isaiah 55, starting with verse 6 and continuing to the 56th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and snow come down uh, from heaven and do not return until they have watered the earth, making it grow forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the things for which I sent. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song and the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress, 
Instead of the briar comes a myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come, and my deliverance will be revealed. Happy is the one who does this, the one who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath, not profaning it, and refrains from doing any evil. Well, there's also the second reading that comes to us from Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, it is uh, the second chap, seventh chapter, uh, verses five through thirteen. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. Do not say this to condemn you. For I said before that you are in my hearts to die together and to live together. I often boast about you. I have great pride in you, and I am filled with consolation. I am overjoyed in all our affliction. For even when we come into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way, disputes without and fears within. But God, who consoles the downcast, consoled us by the arrival of Titus, not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was consoled about you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. And even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it at that time, for I see that I grieved you with that letter, though only briefly. Now I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because your grief led to repentance. For you felt a godly grief, so that you were not harmed in any way by us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death. For see what earnestness this godly grief has produced in you, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point, you have proved yourselves guiltless in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not on account of one who did the wrong, nor on account of one who was wronged, but in order that your zeal for us might be made known to you before God. In this, we find comfort. Well, both of these readings are a little lengthy, but this is God's word for us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Wise God, as I have prepared for this message, I pray that I might be that messenger of hope and positive care and concern for the people of God who hear this. Oh, so move and change us, Lord. Guide us to that end. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sermon title was Dysfunctional But Delivered. Well, I go back to my days at Messiah College. I met a friend there named Joe Brady. He and I were uh, eventually colleagues uh, in ministry together in the United Methodist Church. Joe used to say this whenever there was a frustrating moment, and it brought a smile to our faces as we laughed. He'd say, if ifs and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. (laughs) Wise humor, wasn't it? Yes. See, if we, if all of the ifs, 
in our life's experience. All the could haves. All the, oh, I should have done it this way. And, ah, uh, you know, they, they, they affect us. They, they seem to be like a plague that, that we just can't, you know, brush off or, uh, you know, and, and put away. They, they keep plaguing our mind and our thoughts. And they have a destructive element about it. You see, those thoughts have such an effect on our spirits that sometimes we get depressed, sometimes bitter, and oftentimes dysfunctional in our living. I have a tough message. Tough for me to preach, tough for me to hear, and tough for you as well to hear. You see, we are dysfunctional people. Sin is our nemesis. We can't help it. We sin. We sin by thought, word, and deed. But we're called to live in grace and love. And because of the grace of Jesus Christ in our lives, we can live differently. We can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do so. In this world where we have that choice, in this chaotic world, what is our witness. I remember years ago at annual conference, Bishop Felton May preached and he started this message with this. We are in a mess. Misery and evil side by side. <laughs> Our world is a mess, and there is misery and evil everywhere we look. Here's the hard part. The undercurrent that has been way back in January and February and still remains uh, vital and alive in some is this undercurrent has caused us to be part of a mess. Misery and evil side by side. And, and, and in order for us to be the church, to be loving and caring people, we need to move beyond that and, and put that aside. And because that's what we need to do about it. Let's, let's pause and, and give further thought so that we might break that what-if pattern that I, I was talking about. That we might stop the misery and evil that side by side. Well, the Apostle Paul, he had written to the Corinthian church in his first letter. It was a, a, a mandate, it was a, a chastisement that they might change their attitudes because there was a teacher who was causing them to be distorted in their thinking. They became dysfunctional because they, they removed themselves from what was the word, the truth, and let this false teacher pull them away from what was the core and essence of the gospel. And, and it undermined the community of believers. There was division and high criticism of Paul. The false teaching caused them to falter. Paul was concerned about this as, as he wrote in the first letter, and he didn't know how they would take his appeal to them. Titus comes back. Titus gives good news that there is an attitude of, of wanting for Paul to come back, repentant spirits putting, pushing aside that one who was the false teacher and and. As a result, Paul recognizes in this second letter this reality and he calls it godly grief, godly sorrow, as another translation might have put it. But this chastening had caused them to come to a place where they had recognized that they missed the target, that they did not leave, live through as people of the gospel. And so the remorse and chagrin came to be. 
Now, now there's, there's, there's a difference in these two things, isn't there? Chagrin. Well, that's, that's when you find out that you, you've, well, uh, <laughs> you've been found out. Yeah, we often hear apologies that come as a result of being found out. That's chagrin. But remorse, that comes from the heart. It's not because I've been caught. It's because I've let this sink in inwardly and cause me to outwardly express that I need to be a different person and to confess and, 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 and to seek forgiveness and to understand in the midst of this mess of life that we indeed do have sorrow for our misgivings, for our misunderstandings, for the times that we have failed one another in word and deed. Well, the prophet Isaiah speaks of this dysfunctionality as well. Israel, Judah, was to go into Babylonian exile because they were not obedient to the word. It was God's chastisement for them. And Isaiah, here writing, is offering that promise and that hope that they will return. And in the midst of that, he's telling them to recognize where they are in the journey to be thankful that God is working through them and for them, causing all of creation, like the trees, to clap their hands. Oh, I love that part of it, of that text. So their, their mess is what he addresses and how they get out of it. And for it is the divine word that brings hope to those who are the exiles. And it's that promise of pardon that God offers that is assured in their return back to their homeland, back to Jerusalem, back to the holy land where, that they love. It is a call to those righteous people to do righteousness. Now, how do you do righteousness? It's not what you appear to do, not, not by the outward signs and symbols, Rather, it is by the inward experience of letting God speak to us and change us, and then by our attitude, living out righteousness as we walk daily in this redemptive love. Okay, so you and I have wounds. Yeah, we do. We have scars. We have hurts. We have a lot of things that have affected us. Dare we live on and, and wait till we're get, we get caught and we have chagrin? Or are we going to be people of remorse and say, Lord, I'm, I'm one of those dif- dysfunctional people who need change, who need to be different? You see, it's time to stop lashing out and start looking within. Dot was her name. Dot. Dorothy, formerly. Dot was 85 years old. And everyone, well, they kind of tolerated Dot. Because Dot, well, because of family issues in her life when she was a child, because of her journey, she became such a negative person that she openly, one time, as I witnessed it, say before a group of people, pointing over to another and saying, I hate her. Everyone was in shock. They couldn't believe that she says it. But they didn't counter her by saying, that's ridiculous. Why say that? Well, she said other things that that caused people to be hurt and harmed. It was her shock factor that gave her a sense of presence around others. It seemed as though that's what she lived by. Well, that, that, that gal... I decided I had to love her no matter what, to show her Christian love. Well, it was my last Sunday. I had finished preaching. I was greeting folks after worship. There was to be a a small function uh, in the social hall. But this old gal from Fifth Street Church waited, delayed, till she was one of the last people 
Now she would say to people, don't you touch me. That day, I extended my hand in fellowship with a smile on my face, letting her know by my body language that I loved her as a fellow believer. And as I reached out, she said, no, give me a hug. And she demanded a kiss as well. <laughs> what a surprise. But what a change. A positive change can come. Now what do we do about that? If that can do it, if the Corinthian church can change, can't you and I? Can't this congregation? My challenge to you is live to forgive. And in that learning to live to forgive, learn to love truly that life in you might come to be that love that only God offers to us we can be a source of healing one for the other in the love of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your life in us. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, when we fail you and we fail one another, but restore us to new life in you. I ask this for the sake of of the people of God called Shepherd's Town for each one of us to come to that greater love and live it out, that righteousness that dwells within us that you make possible, make possible in our daily walk. I ask these things in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen.